This is the time of year when I'm really happy to report to library members and friends that our annual fund last year was successful and all your contributions uh, have made a good impact on every area of the library. Programs like this evening's, uh, our book seminars, our children's library, buying books in print and electronically and everything we do here at the library. So thank you for your help last year on behalf of the board and the staff. Before we do begin, let me ask any of you who might have a cell phone or a pager or a laptop or anything that's going to make a noise to just take it out and uh, turn it off. I know that our speaker will certainly appreciate it. And we also record these events and put them on the library's website and they get broadcast on YouTube. Uh, so if your phone goes off, it will be on YouTube forever. <laughs> Tonight I am so pleased to welcome a library member um, and friend to our institution, Joyce Johnson, the author of the new book, The Voice is All, The Lonely Victory of Jack Kerouac, published by Penguin. This is uh, Ms. Johnson's fascinating, well-researched study of Kerouac, and it's based on her life and her knowledge of Jack on a personal basis, and her research that she has completed over the last few years in the Byrd Collection of the New York Public Library. It was back in 2002 that Kerouac's papers became available to researchers, and she was telling me upstairs that she's had an interesting process of uh, accessing the material and using it for this book. Ms. Johnson's books include the National Book Critics Circle Award winner, Minor Characters, a book that we do have here at the library, and I would highly recommend to all of you. It's a great read. Missing Men from 2004, Doors Wide Open, A Beat Love Affair in Letters, 1957-58, published back in 2010, and In the Night Cafe. Our friends from the corner bookstore are outside and they're happy to sell you a copy of The Voice Is All, and Ms. Johnson will certainly uh, inscribe one for you after our question and answer. So please join me in welcoming Joyce Johnson. to be here. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Good. I'm going to talk a, a bit about Jack and then I'm going to uh, trace his development as into a writer by uh, reading a few passages from my book. All dreams, Jack Kerouac once wrote, come from visions of experience. They are released because they're already there in the mind. In late November of 1951, seven months after he'd completed his first draft of On the Road, one particularly vivid dream seemed to open a window through which he could glimpse the future. In it, he'd been brought to a cocktail party at the very respectable Yale Club, wearing the old leather jacket a dead shipmate had given him in 1942. But he wasn't at all embarrassed by his shabby appearance. In fact, he felt rather stylish and avant-garde, until he noticed that all the other guests were wearing leather jackets and all smoking marijuana quite openly. <laughs> the Yale Club, in fact, was filled with people who looked like hipsters, and who to Jack seemed to represent an anarchy that would come to America, taking the form of a, what he called a new virility that would be sadomasochistic and bisexual, an anarchy that would resemble his original idea of the Beat Generation, but only in a superficial way. He realized in the dream, and when he wrote about it afterwards, that if this anarchy came, he wouldn't participate. Or if he did, one side of himself would be fighting the other. For, as he admitted in his journal, I am inconceivably old-fashioned. What Jack understood so well about himself 
would later bewilder both the fans and the detractors who regarded him as the king of the beats. But there were two sides to everything about Jack Kerouac, and to insist on one side rather than the other has amounted to a basic misunderstanding of the person he actually was for about half a century. I met Jack in January 1957 at the counter of a Howard Johnson's in Greenwich Village. It was a blind date arranged by Allen Ginsberg. I paid for Jack's hot dogs and coffee because he'd been shortchanged earlier that day when he bought cigarettes with his last $20 bill. Jack's first novel, The Town and the City, had been published in 1950. Despite receiving some enthusiastic reviews, seven years later he was largely unknown and desperately poor, and none of the seven novels he'd written following The Town and the City had been published. As Jack came and went in my life over the next two years, I discovered that he was a man of profound contradictions, alternately tender and remote, exuberant and open, then silent and withdrawn. But despite his shortcomings as a lover, no beginning writer could have found a better friend. He not only read the pages of the novel I just started, but urged me to take my writing more seriously, opened myself up to the kinds of experiences that would enable me to write what he called a big book. In the 1950s, it was extremely rare for a male writer or artist to talk to a young woman in that way. No one was more aware than Kerouac himself that he had a dual nature, a theme that recurs throughout his journals. He was at heart deeply traditional, the product of his Franco-American Catholic upbringing in Lowell, Massachusetts, a background with far-reaching implications that his many biographers have not usually chosen to explore. At the same time, he was an outlaw, challenging the conventions of accepted behavior in life, as well as in literature. He craved companionship, yet sought solitude. He desired women and married three times, yet found deep emotional intimacy only in his relationships with men. He came out of an ethnic culture that resisted assimilation and fiercely clung to its own French dialect, which in Canada is called Joual. Yet he set himself to master English, which he did not speak fluently until his late teens, and fell in love with America with the passion of an outsider, while always feeling only half American. Uprooted from his Franco-American community in Lowell, Massachusetts at 17, when a football scholarship to Columbia brought him to New York, Jack was excited and stimulated by Manhattan, but he never felt at home there or found anyone who could speak Chihuahua. At the time, Franco-Americans were a despised minority. In New England, they were called white niggers. Very few of them had made a journey like Jack's into the American mainstream. And on the road, there's a passage in which Sal Paradise ruefully refers to his white ambitions. Only someone who didn't feel white would have used that term. In Kerouac's first novel, The Town and the City, he deliberately concealed his ethnicity. And even in the first draft of On the Road, in which he originally gave all the characters, including himself, their real life names, he referred to it very little. In his next book, however, Visions of Cody, which he started writing in the fall of 1951, and which he regarded as his masterpiece, he finally allowed himself to inhabit his Franco-American identity openly, and even included passages in Joao. For his entire life, Jack balanced between his two languages, finding the English equivalents for the French in his head. He felt neither belonged to him, since in the process of his acquiring English, he had lost some of his French. When Jack retreated from the fame on the road had brought him only a year after winning it, the Franco-American side of him became more and more dominant. By then, he had been to many destinations and each time learned that nothing he found could match his dreams and expectations but fame had been the cruelest disappointment of all. People had always been drawn to Jack because of his tremendous appreciation of life and his capacity to make the ordinary seem radiant. Yet underneath his passionate embrace of experience was a terror of death and emptiness that could be traced back to his earliest childhood experiences. Even in a single conversation, Jack was changeable, his mood shifting from light to dark, from color to color, just as they do in his writing. In fact, it's that quality of never being in stasis that makes his voice, with its constant flows and eddies of thought and associations, 
seem so alive on the page. It took him years to learn what he called in 1951 his interior music, which had the French overtones he had previously excluded from his English. He called his newfound approach to writing spontaneous prose, but it took tremendous discipline to reach the mental state of transfixation that it required. During the same momentous year, 1951, the year in which Kerouac finally found his voice and where I end my book, Jack ceased trying to write conventionally plotted fiction with composite characters and abandoned the third person omniscient narrator's voice he'd been using in his fiction. He had resisted using his first person voice for years, but finally he recognized and embraced its power. Starting in his late teens, Jack recorded the long process of his development in his journals. Journals that, along with the rest of his vast archive, were not made fully available to scholars for four decades. Meanwhile, the writers of the various Kerouac biographies had little or no access to this crucial material. Their books were largely based on interviews, letters shown to them by Jack's friends, and the assumptions they made about the verisimilitude of Jack's fiction. These portrayals of Kerouac tended to emphasize the most sensational episodes in his story, creating a picture of chaos and of a man without a center, adding up to a life story that made little sense. No one had read what Jack had to say about his most important relationship, not the one he had with Neil Cassidy, but the one he had with his work. No one saw the pile of discarded novel starts that attested to four years of frustrating attempts to write on the road before the final scroll draft was written in three weeks in the spring of 1951. While Jack's friends could recall being astonished by his recitations of long passages by Dostoevsky, no one was aware of what a prodigiously wide-ranging reader he'd been from the time he was in his teens when he discovered Goethe on one of those days when he'd cut classes to spend his time at the Lowell Public Library. No one understood that the King of the Beats, who supposedly never revised, actually had engaged the most brutal and self-critical form of revision, the setting aside of manuscript after manuscript. In fact, the most important information about Kerouac only trickled out bit by bit as small portions of his papers were published, allowing big misconceptions to become cemented to his legend in the meanwhile. It's not writing, it's typewriting, wrote Kerouac's detractor, Truman Capote. But even Jack's fans were misinformed. He just spewed his words on paper, Patti Smith said admiringly in 2007, expressing a widely shared misunderstanding of Kerouac's creative process that does not do justice to the extraordinarily dedicated artist he actually was. Jack was 34 by the time I met him, nine months before the publication of On the Road made his name the household word that it is today, a word that still comes with a heavy baggage of misunderstanding. By 1957, he was beginning to wonder whether he had written himself out, although that was something he never talked about. Following On the Road, which no one dared to publish for six years, he had written his books in very short, intense bursts of concentration, as if, as if each novel was a poem, creating a stunning body of work that, as John Clellan Holmes astutely pointed out, is not so much concerned with events as it is with consciousness, in which the ultimate events are images. Believing that in these books he had far surpassed on the road, Jack had bet everything he had on the new approach to writing he discovered in 1951 and had consumed himself in the process. He was only 19 when he first made his Faustian bargain to sacrifice everything to his work, and he followed through on it all too well. The public may think of Jack as a man who spent his life on the road. The truth is, that he spent about ten, 10 years holed up in a small room in his mother's queen's apartment, working steadily and self-critically, avoiding distractions like love affairs, saving up all his living for brief forays into Manhattan to see his friends. It was a remarkably austere existence for such a young man, yet his work had filled his life. But when writing became Jack's ultimate high, this was dangerous for him. He did not know how to live between the highs of creation. Between books, there would be long, empty valleys of self-destructive depression. Take care of this man, Jack's Viking editor, Keith Jennison, said to me the morning after an extraordinary review of On the Road in the New York Times compared him to Hemingway, who had been the voice of the lost generation. 
I was only 21 and I'd never had to take care of anyone before, but I'd been puzzled by Jack's flat response to such an obviously great review as we read it together standing under a street lamp at 66th Street and Broadway. Over the next few months, I had a crash course in the way the media could take hold of an idea like the Beat Generation, distort its meaning, spread it far and wide, and create a template for a new hedonistic lifestyle that so many people seemed immediately willing to adopt. I also saw what the glare of public attention could do to a very fragile artist who soon longed to have his anonymity back and had fantasies about becoming a hermit in a mountain cabin. In the end, Jack's phenomenal success took more from him than it gave. For the first time in his life, he had money and fame, but he could not recognize himself in the media-created image of the King of the Beats. A half century later, I sat in the Byrd collection of the New York Public Library, staring at the penciled handwriting in the August 24th entry in Jack's Mexico City notebook, written only 10 days before the publication of On the Road. There I found what Jack had kept to himself, the confession of the Beat Generation, the name that had come to him in a moment of inspiration and excitement in 1947, no longer meant anything to him. By 1950, Jack wrote, there was no such thing as the Beat Generation. During the late 40s, when he briefly believed that artists and disaffected war veterans, outlaws like Neil Cassidy and Herbert Hunky, and a vanguard of black beboppers could form a movement that would lead the world out of the shadow of the atomic bomb and into a future of joy. The term Beat Generation had captured for him the gloomy sharpness of the people he knew. Within three years, however, Jack's hopeful vision had evaporated as conformity came to America along with a brand new war in Korea, and the original members of his Beat Generation began disappearing into settled lives or jails. I can only imagine that it must have been profoundly disturbing for him to be thrust into the role of spokesman for a movement he felt had essentially gone out of existence. Vibrantly handsome, he looked as if he had stepped right out of the North Woods. Jack looked as if he'd been perfectly cast as the King of the Beats, even though he wasn't cut out to play the role. Shy, introverted, and secretive, despite his apparent openness, he was reliant on alcohol, not only for public appearances, but even the gatherings of friends. Nonetheless, he tried to rise to the occasion. So many people had found it on the road, the liberating message they'd been waiting for, that no one wanted to hear there was no such thing as a present day beat generation. Patiently, conscientiously, however, Jack tried to explain to reporters who wasn't listening what he'd actually meant by beat, to be pure, beatific, inward, and poor. Stunned by the distortions of his words that appeared in print, Jack very quickly lost his naive trust that reporters were interested in communicating the truth. The media's belittling depictions of beatniks, the hostility directed at his novel and at him, only increased Jack's feeling of being an outsider in America. Nine months after On the Road came out, he secluded himself in the house he'd bought for his mother in Northport, Long Island. There he drank more heavily than ever, and struggled with a novel about his childhood that he'd been longing to write but had to put aside. Writing was no longer an ecstatic process for him. The harsh critiques of his work had made him feel self-conscious and uncertain for the first time. Even his extraordinary memory didn't seem to be working. I just don't care to remember the details, he wrote me dejectedly. What Jack had hungered for most, the appreciation of what he had achieved, as an innovative novelist, and most of all, as a writer of extraordinary prose, had largely been denied him. And although he kept publishing books almost to the end of his short life, it is only in this century that he has gradually come to be regarded as a classic American writer. When Jack and I broke up in the fall of 1958, I was 22 and still working on that first novel that would take me another three years to complete. I did not feel the slightest temptation to write about Jack Kerouac for another 25 years when I suddenly realized I had an historical perspective on my life in the 1950s and that I could see my experiences during that period, including my involvement with the Beats, as emblematic of that transitional moment in women's history. In 2000, I follow up my, my memoir, Minor Characters, with Door Wide Open, a collection of the many letters Jack and I wrote each other during our on and off two-year romance. 
By then, my understanding of Jack had deepened as portions of material from his papers had gradually been released in book form. The fact that I've written about Kerouac again in The Voice Is All may lead some people to assume that I'm haunted by our love affair. I think I've been haunted by something much stranger, the gulf between my memories of the man I knew and the legendary King of the Beats, whose name is still so often evoked as a cultural reference point that I could never have forgotten him, even if I'd wanted to. I have always found that gulf very troubling, and in my three books, I have tried in various ways to deal with it. Fate happened to put me at Jack Kerouac's side at the very moment that On the Road had its immediate impact upon America, bringing on the culture war that continues to this day. It was the great eye-opening experience of my life and the most important part of my education. As a first-hand witness of the, that romanticized and vilified piece of history, I felt impelled to keep trying to set the record straight. In 2007, when the Kerouac archive finally became available to all scholars, not just the biographers the uh, state had authorized, I realized it would now be possible for someone to write the kind of biography I had long been waiting for, a book that would reveal what the Kerouac legend had largely obscured, the story of a writer who, after years of struggle, finally discovers the voice that matches his vision. Aren't you done with Jack yet? I asked myself very sternly, and to my surprise, the answer was no. In the Kerouac papers, I was able to trace the story I was sure Jack had recorded there. I end the voice as all with the prophetic and tragic recognition he had in 1951. I'm lost, but my work is found. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to um, start off by reading you a little <coughs> section of the book about Jack's childhood. Um, Jack is uh, four or five years old. It's right after his older brother, nine-year-old Gerard, has died of rheumatic fever. Um, and the family has, has moved to a new house. Uh, the, the death of his older brother was you know, one of the huge events that shaped Jack's consciousness and haunted him throughout his life. Uh, if you ever get a chance, I, I, a lot of people, you know, they, 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 they don't go beyond um, um, On the Road and, and Dharma Bums, but, but he, he wrote an extraordinary short novel about his brother called Visions of Gerard, which has some of his most beautiful prose in it. I really recommend it. Just like his father, Jean-Baptiste, Leo Kerouac kept moving his family around. The second floor apartment on Hilder Street was the fourth place in the Centralville neighborhood where Jack had lived since he was born. By the time Jack was 17, he had lived at 11 different locations. Did the Kerouacs move so frequently in order to find better quarters? After 1929, they definitely needed increasingly cheaper ones as Leo Kerouac's fortune sharply declined. But were they also driven by some internal restlessness, some unhappiness that pursued them from place to place, making them start packing again not long after they'd settled down somewhere for a while? In Gabrielle Kerouac's old age, when Jack could finally afford to buy an entire house for her, no living situation would contend her. From 1958 to 68, they would pull up stakes six times in Long Island, Florida, and Massachusetts three times futilely returning to parts of the East Coast they'd already given up on. Lupine Road, Burnaby Street, Bowyer Street, Hildreth Street, West Street, Ruby Street, Sarah Avenue, Gershon Avenue, Phoebe Avenue. In the town and the city, Jack wrote that for children to be uprooted from a home they had lived in amounted to a catastrophe of their hearts. What dreams children have of walls and doors and ceilings that they always knew? What terror they have on waking up at night in strange new rooms, disarrayed and unarranged, all frightful and unknown. Our house is our corner of the world, wrote the philosopher Gaston Bachelard. As has often been said, it's our first universe in every sense of the word. In his view, we comfort ourselves by reliving memories of protection. Something closed must retain our memories while leaving them their original value as images. When Vladimir Nabokov and his family had to leave Russia, Nabokov suffered the physical loss of Vyra 
the much-loved country estate that had been the scene of his childhood and the birthplace of his creativity. He never saw Vyra again, but even after he was in exile, it remained his in memory and was a source of strength. He called it his unreal estate. But Jack had no such closed psychic property. Instead, there was a permanent sense of homesickness, all the more painful for not being attached to any one dwelling. Yet all that uprooting may have sharpened his memory, each leave-taking prompting him to hold on to certain images of home, images that never faded from his consciousness before the scene changed again. Over and over in the dreams Jack recorded from the late 1940s through the early 60s, the family, frequently just Jack and his mother, are on the run, in flight from some nameless threat that pursues them from place to place. At different addresses, the heavy car family furnishings, the only vestiges of stability, keep turning up. Sometimes in ominously red nightmare parlors, all that furniture, even his mother's piano, becomes oppressive. The Beaulieu Street parlor, where Gerard lay in his coffin, keeps reappearing, la salle de mort. It was in a nightmare Jack had at the age of seven, after the family moved from Hildreth Street to West Street. The horrible dream of the rattling red living room, where skeletons danced because my brother Gerard haunted them. He dreamed he woke up screaming next to a Victroller in an adjoining room. In a brief autobiographical sketch written when he was 19, Jack described himself as a morbid child of six, all alone in one of these dark and dull parlors where sofas and chairs cast funereal black shadows. He's listening to the tick of the clock. The sky outside is overpoweringly drab. He can remember himself wondering whether it wouldn't have been better not to be born. The move to Hilda Street in August 1926, so soon after Gerard's death, seems to have been a disaster for him. At 28, he still recalled the deathly grayness hanging over everything the day the family took possession of their quarters in the house that seemed huge and shrouded. Moving had meant that they were leaving Gerard behind forever rather than waiting for him to return. As young as he was, he could sense the deliberate beginning of forgetfulness. It didn't help that his new home was one house away from a cemetery. On his first day there, he reluctantly followed his mother and sister inside. As they walked down a hallway, his mother opened the closet and something white came tumbling out and whacked her on the head. Les morts sont dans la maison, she screamed, terrifying Jack, who thought Gerard's angry spirit had pursued them to their new home. But his sister Nan and his father burst out laughing because it had only been an ironing board. Perhaps the laughter helped jolt Gay back to reality. Later that day, when Jack told her he was hungry, she immediately made him a bread and butter and sugar sandwich, something he never forgot. It was as if his mother, closed off with her grief, had been blind to him, but had suddenly awakened. Before Gerard became so ill, he'd been Jack's chief playmate, and to some extent his minder. When other boys came over to play with her older son, Gay would chase them away, telling them that Gerard belonged to Jack. On Hildreth Street, Jack discovered that I was alive and could do things on my own. He recalled making a dramatic speech, complete with gestures, to a mattress on the sun porch soon after the family moved in. In the void of his brother's absence, Jack's imagination became his companion, summoning up another world for him that he could enter simply by playing the march of the tin soldiers or Dardanella over and over on the Victrola and marching up and down in the living room in time to the rhythms of the music. He would throw sofa pillows on the floor and jump onto them, wrestling the great vulture that had swooped down upon him, always managing to get away. Once pretending he was trapped in the coils of a giant snake, he went out in the front yard, trussed himself up with a rope, and lay there writhing so convincingly that older boys coming home from school asked who had done that to him. As a death-haunted child, he had a need to feel invincible. Confronting the terrors he deliberately made up, he could be as self-sufficient as if he would be later on in the deep, safe solitudes of his writing. Gray colors Jack's accounts of his early years, but gradually brown begins to seep in. The brown is often associated with his mother. It was the color of the bathrobe she wore when she tended to him when he was sick. It was the brown of her kitchen, always the safe, warm place wherever they lived filled with the reassuring smells of vanilla and caramel puddings, and all the brown food she cooked for them, oatmeal, beans, cortons, 
rich stews swimming in pork fat, date pie. Gray was the color of feeling dead or deadened. Brown was life-giving. But it's also the color of the word sad that tolls through old Jack's writings, the brown of a primordial melancholy, as well as the familiar comforting brown of home. He would try to escape that brown, but memory would always draw him back to it. It was the color of his homesickness. <coughs> Sometimes small children have epiphanies they remember for the rest of their lives. Virginia Woolf called such experiences moments of being and saw them as the foundations of consciousness. In 1942, Jack recalled one that, that had occurred just before his seventh birthday on a February day that he considered the day I was born. On his way home through the snow-covered streets, pulling his sled behind him, he'd stop to look at the sad windows of the houses. Why, why, I asked myself, age six. Pourquoi, I might have said, because I was French. At any rate, I wanted to know, and I couldn't quite make it out, and I still cannot make it out, which is, in a nutshell, the story of the inward war raging inside me. He would always believe that until that moment, he'd been walking along dead, or in other words, locked inside himself. But then, with a sweep of bewilderment, I began to live, a man on the earth, his relation to all things, to his fellow man, to his society, and to the universe. Jack knew very early, from the time he was in his early teens, that he wanted to be a writer. And he also, he also knew that in order to accomplish that, um, he would have to leave Lowell and, and, and go to a university, which uh, no member of his family had ever done, and, and go to a big city. Uh, he, had his eye on, he had his eye on New York. So he really set himself to become a, a very, very good athlete, uh, a runner, and then a football player. And he did, he did achieve his objective, because he, uh, he did get a, a scholarship uh, to uh, Columbia University, preceded by a year at the Horace Mann Prep School to make up some deficits in his education. Uh, having, having achieved this, uh, at the beginning of his sophomore year, uh, he walked out on the whole thing. He, was, he, he had spent the summer doing a lot of writing, and that was, what he, that was really all he wanted to do. He, he didn't want to spend hours in, at football practice. He didn't want to go, you know, go, have to go to a job washing dishes uh, in the lion's den at, at Columbia. Uh, he just wanted to write, and, uh, and, and one day, after a disagreement with the coach, he walked out on Columbia and uh, boarded a bus that took him down south uh, to Thomas, toward Thomas Wolfe country. He was very much under the influence of Thomas Wolfe at that time. Well, he, he got as far as Washington, where he uh, checked into a, a cheap hotel and then realize what he'd done. Uh, but um, he stuck to his guns, went back up north, and didn't go back, just didn't go back to Columbia. Um, he, he got a job in Hartford, in a gas station, instead. And there he wrote and wrote and wrote. This is a, we're talking about a 19-year-old boy. Today, despite its glass towers, Hartford is a depressed shell of a city whose streets are deserted after dark. But in 1941, with the country on the verge of war and its aircraft factories humming, it had turned into a boom town. Jack responded to its stepped-up rhythms with some attempted typewriter jazz of his own. Step on the gas, toot the horn, he typed on the keys of the Underwood he'd rented as soon as he arrived. Whip through that intersection. You don't give a damn, Hartford. You've money, women, drinks, you've got everything. Hartford was jumping at night with workers off their shifts, pouring into the restaurants and taverns on Main Street. It seemed a terrific place to be until Jack went back to his room with its stained brown wallpaper. He'd rented it for four fifty a week. His desk was a greasy table. His bed was lumpy. His window overlooked a garage-filled backyard that stank of urine. When he turned on a light, roaches crawled out of the underwood he'd rented, but it was his own place. I'm happy, he wrote one night. He had bought a ream of yellow paper and was filling those sheets with solid blocks of words, 
tight single space almost to the edge of the page. Maybe he wrote 200 in stories, stories and sketches those eight weeks he was in Hartford, as he suggests in Vanity of Dulois. Maybe he wrote only 60. They were all going to go into one book Jack was calling a top in Underwood. He ran out of money fast in October. As he waited to be paid in the middle of the month, he became literally the starving young writer William Soroyan had written about. Soroyan was another of his, of his heroes. It was the first time Jack had ever gone hungry. One night he wrote himself a meal. It began with a thick mushroom soup served in a heavy white bowl. Then came a huge sirloin steak. Through it runs a great bone protruding at one end like the mighty hock of a beast. I grasp this bone and snarl into the steak, thrusting my mouth into the warm brown side of the meat. Oh my God, but I eat. After a few days without food, Jack fainted at work. A guy he was friendly with at the service station took him home and had his mother feed him up. Through all this, he never asked of his family for help. In a direct, intimate voice, still more influenced by Soroyan than Wolf, he wrote about his swim in Long Island Sound. Man, but I was a Breton that day. Man, but I was powerful. Man, but my mother looked heroic, ancient, great, and mighty, looking out to sea at her son. He wrote about his grandfather, Jean-Baptiste Kerouac, swinging his lantern in a storm, daring God to strike him down. As if to refute his father's belief that a Canuck could not become a writer, he celebrated Joual. The language called Canadian French is the strongest in the world when it comes to words of power. It's too bad that one cannot study it in college, for it's one of the languagey languages in the world. It's the language of the tongue and not of the pen. It is a terrific, a huge language. And he used it deliberately in the story about his grandfather. In a curious poem that he composed, he canceled out his father entirely, because his father was furious with him for having walked out on his football career. I am my mother's son. All other, other identities are artificial and recent. Naked, basic, actually, I am my mother's son. I emerged from her womb and set out into the earth. He was feeling his latent power as he sat up nights at the typewriter in his little room in Hartford, driving his stuff home, American-wise, feeling his connection to Wolf, Soroy, and Halper, Whitman, and Joyce, discovering that he was a writing machine with a store of literature that is boundless, enormous, endless, and rich. As for what scholars or critics might think of his efforts, they're cold, you're warm, you're red hot, you can write all day. On November 13th, he had to give the rented typewriter back, so he wrote about how he, how he felt about that, too. Hell, they're taking everything away, even myself. That morning, he'd been down to his last four cents. He couldn't even buy himself a nickel cup of coffee. He cheered himself up, imagining a trip to California. First of all, he'd want to go south, where it's warm, and where there are weeping willow trees with mosses, and old houses with ground-level porches and where, like Eugene Gant, he would sun himself in New Orleans on the banks of the Mississippi. He called the story he was writing a little legend about myself. When he had money to buy stamps, he sent stories to Harper's, the Atlantic Monthly and Esquire. He needed to justify to his parents the path he'd taken, and the only way to do it was sell some of his writing. The stories bounced back to him with rejection slips. <coughs> on the one attached to farewell songs, Sweep From My Trees, which he'd continued to revise that fall. There were brief comments from three readers at Esquire, one of which said, good, but not for Esky. Thanksgiving promised to be grim. Instead of eating his mother's cooking, Jack had to stay in Hartford and work a five-hour shift. When he returned to his room, there was a knock on the door, and there stood his best friend, Sebastian Sampas, who had shown up to keep him company during the lonely holiday. In some ways, according to the account of it in Vanity of Duluas, it was an awkward reunion. For Sebastian, it was apparently full of romantic pathos, like a sad Burgess Meredith movie. It pained him to see in Jack what he considered a fallen condition in a desolate furnished room. In the novel, Jack Duluas cuts off Sabi Sabakas's lamentations curtly telling him that the conditions of his life right now are not important. Tears did Jack no good. Tears would only have undermined his determination. What he badly needed was Sebastian's approval of the brave, seemingly foolhardy step he had taken in the service of art, something he hadn't heard from anyone. A few days afterward, Jack got a postcard from his father. 
Leo had managed to find a job in Lowell, and the Kerouacs were moving back there. He wanted Jack to help them pack and then go home with them. It was a sojourn in Hartford in which Jack had begun to learn the techniques of suffering in the working world, which includes football and war, and the techniques of solitude was over. In 1946, um, which was a year before he met Neil Cassidy, who would later inspire the character Dean Moriarty, uh, Jack thought for the first time about writing uh, a road novel. Um, and uh, his original idea was that, that a young man recovering from a long illness uh, takes a hitchhiking trip across America during which he encounters a series of symbolic characters. Uh, when, um, when Jack met Neil Cassidy, Neil got folded into the story. In, in the various versions of <coughs> On the Road, uh, Jack tried to write between uh, uh, 1948 and 1951. Here's Jack on his first um, on his first road trip, um, he was bound for first for Denver, uh, where he planned to see, to see Neil Cassidy and also Allen Ginsberg, and then to the coast. Uh, California was the, his dream destination. In 1951, William Lee Steep Moon, a writer often compared to Kerouac, set out to explore the back roads of America and the white van he made famous in blue highways. The vehicle featured a bunk bed, a camping stove, and a portable toilet that Lee Steep Moon had installed. He also took with him a typewriter, a tape recorder, and a very useful credit card. Jack, on the other hand, went on the road in a pair of flimsy harachas, the favorite summer footwear of Greenwich Village Bohemians. He was carrying a small knapsack containing a change of clothes and one of his spiral notebooks that had $60 in his pocket. Except for the money which had to last him all the way to the coast, he was traveling as light as those freight hoppers and hobos who had captured his imagination in the films he saw in the 30s. And he never found that straight red line from here to there he'd been counting on. The night of July 19th found him marooned in the rain somewhere near Bear Mountain, where Route 6 was headed north rather than west, and where there was no passing traffic to pick him up. He had to take a bus back to New York in order to get another to Chicago, a detour that cost him a day and two-thirds of his cash. Two days later, he finally connected with Route 6, just outside Joliet, Illinois, where he hitched a ride on a dynamite truck and felt the thrill of heading at last into the legendary West, a trip that had taken vivid shape in his imagination before he embarked on it. Lee Steep Moon returned from the road with stacks of tapes to be transcribed. Jack had returned to Ozone Park in the fall of 1947, with remarkably little down on paper in the form of notes on his recent adventures. Carol and Cassidy would later swear she'd seen him standing on Denver street corners, jotting down everything he saw and heard, a fact that immediately made its way into, into Kerouac biography. But the truth is that apart from a paragraph listing the names of places he passed through, Jack recorded very little of what he saw and experienced during the course of his first trip to the West. As the changing American landscape kept unrolling before him, he was far too absorbed in what his eyes and memory were constantly taking in to be able to pull back from it to take out his pencil. Meanwhile, his mind must have had to make constant adjustments between what he'd imagined and what he actually found. Jack wrote no accounts of the moments when his Western fantasies had to give way to post-war desecrations of what he'd expected to find. His first sight of the dry, bedded, and already polluted Mississippi with its big rank smell, or his arrival in Council Bluffs, Iowa, where streets of cute suburban cottages obliterated the great gathering place of covered wagons described by Francis Parkman, or the first genuine cowboy he saw walking along like any beat character past the bleak meat warehouses of Omaha, or the travesty of Wild West Week in Cheyenne. Left out as well are the things that surpassed his dreams. The green smells of the prairie, the brightness of the stars over the Great Plains, the astonishing long flat wastelands of sand and sagebrush, 
The moment when the great snow-covered Rockies finally loomed up before his eyes in Longmont, Colorado, and he knew that one more ride would take him into smoky Denver, where he was awaited by Neil Allen and the whole Denver gang, none of whose actual spoken words he would write down in his notebooks, although he would evoke them with seemingly total recall and on the road. The trip Jack takes, Jack takes there, although it can be traced on a map, is a journey often through his own mind, as Lawrence Stern's travels in France were once described by Virginia Woolf. Jack's notebooks contain no proof that he actually ran into every one of that string of colorful Western characters whose paths he crossed en route to Denver. But when he wrote about them four years later, he certainly used some of them symbolically and structurally, as had been his intention when he first thought writing a road novel in 1946. Since duality was a theme he was far from done with, Jack would use the sneaky behavior of the hyperactive Montana Slim to evoke the trickster side of Dean Moriarty's nature. On his portrayal of, Mi of Mississippi Jean, who, like an older brother, tenderly looks after a 16-year-old runaway, would signal that South Paradise would find a guide and brother in Dean, despite Dean's failings. In one famous scene in the novel, Sal Paradise wakes up around sunset in a trackside hotel room in Des Moines with the recognition that for the first time in his life, I really didn't know who I was for about 15 strange seconds. I was just somebody else, some stranger, and my whole life was a haunted life, the life of a ghost. This disoriented awakening, often cited in biographies, is the turning point in Jack's perception of himself and his entire generation was described in a piece Jack wrote in 1940, November 1947, right after he returned home from his travels. But the reference to a haunted life, which would later give it a generational significance, was not attached to it until 1951. It was an image that had been with Jack ever since his friends started dying in World War II, and had even thought of using it as a title for his early Galloway novel. The red, the red late afternoon light Sal wakes up to when on the road, is the same red light that suffuses Jack's memory of birth, which he first described in a novel fragment in 1945, and would use again in Dr. Sachs. And that lost feeling of being somebody else had been set down on paper for the first time in the poem, I Am My Mother's Son, which Jack wrote at 19 in his British room in Hartford, when he also felt very far from home. I woke up in the middle of the night and realized to my horror that I did not remember who I was. It is clear that Jack brought the mind of a poet to his fiction rather than the mind of a note-taking reporter. A poet, W.B. Yeats once wrote, paraphrasing his friend George Russell, does not transmute into song what he has learned and experienced. Reversing the order, the poet instead first imagines, and then later, the imagination attracts its affinities. Thank you. older people there who had gone to college at the same time that you know, Jack um, Allen was an undergraduate at Columbia. And, and I met him at a party. And, um, and Alan also became very involved with my, my best friend, a woman named Elise Cowan. And then, um, not a year or so after that, Alan went out to California and then when he came back in 1956, bringing Jack along with him, um, you know, he um, looked up Elise Cowan and, and, uh, and I decided to introduce me to Jack. In, in one of the books over there, you say something, or one of the reviewers says something about uh, that you really, really reveal how, how necessary the women's movement was to be. Yeah. So I wonder if you would say something about how you felt as a, as a female with um, Kerouac and uh, how it would, would be treated women at that time. Well, the Beats didn't treat women very well, but neither did anybody else. <laughs> I mean, the, the 1950s were really a terribly 
misogynistic time for, for women who wanted to do any you know serious work. You know they were they they were absolutely discouraged. I went you know I, I went to to Barnard, famous women's college, and um, um, and I took what writing courses they had. And you know, our, we were very actively discouraged by our male professors. You know, they would they would write on my paper quite a little existentialist art work. Oh. You know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I remember the, the one particular class, so the first session, the uh, the teacher told the, told the, the women in the room, um, um, if you were really going to be writers, you wouldn't even be sitting in this room. You'd be you know, out exploring the back roads of America. I mean, that was pure nonsense. So this inspired me with, 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 with a desire to um, write about what they considered women's very uninteresting little lives and, and, and to write the truth and to also write the truth about the kinds of sex lives young women were actually having. You don't mind if I ask you about this book that you did write, and it's considered the first uh, woman's beat novel, Come and Join the Dance. Yeah. Would you tell us maybe a little bit about that and how Kerouac influenced that? Okay. Um, it was a novel that was actually set at Barnard College in, in the last uh, the last the last two weeks, just as the uh, Susan, the heroine is uh, about to graduate. Um, uh, and she has this feeling that um, nothing real has ever happened to her. She's never had, you know, she's never had sex. She sort of thrusts herself into ex all kinds of experiences in those last two weeks at, uh, at, at college. Are you, are you going to consider republishing it at any point? I haven't been able to get anyone to republish it, unfortunately, which is a disappointment to me. But um, a lot of scholars know about it. And, um, well, uh, I, the Bird Collection has a copy. I, I know that. I know that. I, um, So in, as, I, as I said in my talk, Jack was very encouraging to me. And, and this was, I can't tell you how rare this was. Um, and I, and I, I feel I, I learned a lot from, from him. I actually didn't think of the novel I was writing as a beat novel. But, but you know, my work and his had certain real affinities. Um, I, I, I learned a lot by writing letters to him. Because I was sort of like writing up to his voice kind of stretched out my sentences, changed my rhythms. Um, yeah. Were there women professors at Barnard at the time who were more encouraging? They weren't teaching writing. <laughs> when you knew what Kerouac, was he connected to sports at all? Because as a young man, it's one aspect of his family was that the father of a certain point was a wrestling promoter. That's right. The family yeah. the wrestling <laughs> matches like a family. That's the right. They go to baseball mm -hmm. games. And the other part of And he'd also thought about being Jack's manager. You know, yeah. Jack would be the football star, yeah, he'd, he'd be, be the manager. Or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he had this you know, ambition to be a kind of impresario. Of, of his childhood was this imaginary baseball game, which had been written up, mm -hmm. uh, that he created with players, a league, pitchers, batters, catchers, uh, and where this went on in his head, kind of like Hoover's book, The Universal Yeah, that's true. And I just wondered if when you knew him, this was part of his ideation, or was this buried in the remote? No, he still, you know, he, he still, he still loves sport. He didn't, you know, he, he no longer, he, he no longer played, but he, you know, he liked football and baseball and he could remember, you know, could remember games in detail, discuss them with bartenders, okay. you know. And, and um, he, you know, he was very proud of the way he'd written about uh, football in his, uh, in his books. Another thing that he was very interested in as a child, and, and, and I think it, it also inspired some of his earliest writing, um, his father um, gambled a lot on the horse races and would take Jack along. 
And Jack got obsessed with horse races. And so he, um, you know, we're talking about a kid of 12, 13. He created these racing newspapers, um, which he laid out very carefully and sort of ruled columns and pasted pictures in. And he was, he was Jack Lewis, the owner and publisher of the, of the paper, the owner of a stable of racehorses, and the jockey of the winning horse. <laughs> and he would, and so he, he wrote, he sort of created a whole imaginary world of, of, um, of the races that he reported on in his paper. And he had, um, he had horse races in his room using marbles. And he would sort of handicap them by setting up obstacles and chipping them slightly to sl slow some of them down. And he would report on these, uh, on, on the outcome of these races. And all these marbles had personalities for him. <laughs> his favorite racehorse, his champion racehorse, oddly enough, was a ball bearing that he called <laughs> repulsion. <laughs> now, as, as I as I think I said, Jack wasn't totally fluent in English until late in his teens, so he, he liked the word, you know, repulsion, which, which sounded, which in his mind, I think must have meant the opposite of, of what it actually means, and he gave that name to his favorite racers. He, he made those kinds of linguistic mistakes. Um, the forerunner um, of Dr. Sachs was a wizard in his imagination, uh, whom he called Dr. Malodorous because he thought, you know, malodorous was one of the most beautiful words <laughs> in, in the language. He probably pronounced it in the French way, malodorous, you know, but, but he, he would make those mistakes. Yeah? That year at Horace Mann must have been a real culture shock for him. Did he speak about that, write about that? Yes, he did. He, he wrote about that a lot um, in, in, in several novels. He, he alludes to it, yeah. Anything you share with us? Well, one thing, one, one thing is um, uh, he came from a very prejudiced background, um, and his, his parents were very anti-Semitic, as was most of Lowell, unfortunately, at that time. And suddenly he was among all these Jewish kids who he found he could relate to and who were very bright and he could talk about books with them and jazz and things that were important to him. So that was kind of a huge experience. And he began going to jazz clubs in Harlem at that time. He used to go with a friend from Horace Mann up to Minton's. And there they, they saw some of the great pioneers of bebop. Yeah? There's, there's a movie which I haven't seen. I think it's called On the Road, or it's just yes, it's out. Yes, it's out, yeah. yeah. It, it, it came out and then it went away. It's coming back in the spring. Have you seen it? I've seen it twice. Yeah. And you, what do you think of it? Um, I, I, I really don't like it. Uh, you know, the, they, they basically threw out the whole book. I mean, it, it's, it's um, you don't know what these characters are looking for. You don't have any social context. What you have are scene after, I mean, they're all attractive young people. You have scene after scene of frenetic activity. You know, much of it's sexual to the point where you, as people, as the characters begin to take off their clothes yet again, you think, oh no, not another sex scene. <laughs> it doesn't build toward anything. Um, the cinematography is very attractive. Uh, the character who plays Jack uh, is, is just completely vacuous because Jack didn't write much dialogue for Dean Murray or for, for Sal Paradise. Uh, who was the narrator of On the Road. And obviously the screenwriter was unable to come up with dialogue for him. So you have this young British actor always looking sensitive and somewhat disturbed and constantly writing everything down in his journal, which as I explained, Jack actually didn't do. <laughs> yeah. Did you recognize the person that you that you met in the papers? Was there a lot of unexpected discoveries? Yeah, well, there were constant. There were, there were constant discoveries. I mean, I I was I was very interested in two things. The you know, 
but I wanted to understand Jack's process of development, and I found I found that you know very faithfully recorded in the journals. I also um, I also was very interested in uh, the sort of unexplored subject of Jack's uh, ethnicity and the degree to which he was a bilingual writer. So I you know I which really people hadn't written about. So I began finding, um, you know, I, I, I found a lot of references to that. And, and um, being, his feelings about being Franco-American was, that was something Jack never talked about, even to, even to close friends. Uh, I heard there's a letter that Al Ginsberg writes to him in which he says to Jack, you have all the natural grace of the true American, whereas Alan felt very un-American by comparison, but I guess that's very American, not to feel quite American enough. Um, one thing um, that I, one big discovery of mine was that just, um, just a few weeks before Jack finally wrote <coughs> the famous scroll draft of On the Road, um, he was sort of desperate. He'd been you know, starting one novel after another and putting it aside, and he wrote a novella in French uh, that which is actually a terrific little book. It's never been published. It's still in his handwriting in the notebook in the Bird Collection. Um, a novel called um, La Nuit et Ma Femme. Uh, and in it is an autobiographical novel, Jack's writing in the first person, which was something he had been resisting doing for years. And he, t he talks about all, you know, wanting to, having all these dreams of being a writer and all the lousy jobs he'd had when he was a kid and walked out on. It's, it's very, very good. Um, and in that, my feeling was that in, by writing in that sort of French voice, um, Jack discovered the voice he would use for Sal Paradise, the narrator of On the Road. Because it was first person, very, very direct. Uh, I, I, it was a real, uh, similarity between those two voices. So the voice, you know, the very American voice of On the Road was born in French. <laughs> yeah. What were you doing at 66th and Broadway reading that review? <laughs> oh, well, I, uh, I lived on 68th Street near Central Park West, and Jack was staying with me. And he had just uh, uh, come up to New York on the Greyhound bus that earlier that day. Um, his publisher hadn't given him any money for the trip, so I had wired him $30. Uh, and uh, at midnight, we, we left the house and went down to the newsstand on 66 and Broadway next to the subway to get the first uh, the morning edition of the New York Times as it came off the truck. So we took the first paper off the pile and read the review standing under a street lamp. So you knew that the review was coming? We knew that it was a review was coming, but we didn't know what it was going to be. And actually, it was, it was a tremendous piece of luck for Jack because it was Labor Day weekend. And the usual daily reviewer, Orville Prescott, who was very conservative in his taste, was away on vacation. So the job of reviewing the book fell to a guy named Gilbert Milstein, who'd sort of been tracking the Beat generation for years, ever since assigning John Cullen Holmes to write an article about it in 1952. So he, uh, he got on the road to review. Maybe th things would have been different if Orville Prescott had gotten mm -hmm. here first. <laughs> <laughs> well, when does his alcoholism really compromise himself? Because at the point you're talking with the review of On the Road, he, he drank a lot, but still kept his eye on the ball to some extent. He, had, he, had, he had problems with alcohol from the time he was in his late teens. Um, and uh, both his parents were alcoholics also. Because it killed him eventually. It did eventually kill him. Yeah, and he would, you know, he would make attempts to stop drinking, but he couldn't sustain them. Yes. I wonder what 
where your muse is taking you now. What are you writing now? Uh, I'm thinking of writing a novel. I've had in mind for a while. And the area, the subject areas that interest you these days? Uh, well, actually, I you know I I um, I worked in publishing beginning in the 1950s and 1960s, and I I sort of wanted to write about that era in publishing. Uh, I mean that is sort of the setting of the novel. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Time for yeah. one more question. Yes, I wanted to ask about the role of Denver in On the Road. It's a focal point for Do you have any reason? Say why, aside from Neil Cassidy <coughs> having been here, Neil Cassidy's father, why do they keep going back to Denver oh, and well, using Denver as a jumping off place? Well, uh, Neil wasn't the only person Jack knew in Denver. Um, um, but before he met Neil, he met uh, two young vet war veterans from Denver who had come to Columbia, Hal Chase and uh, um, and Ed White, who uh, who had who had known Neil Cassidy, and you know were very impressed by him. And they had encouraged Neil to write. They were you know been young high school intellectuals writing about Dostoevsky, uh, and so Jack encountered them in Columbia, became good friends with them. So so they were among the people, and, they, and he met other people while he was in Denver too, um, and also. Uh, he had a kind of fantasy about um, uh, getting a ranch out west in Denver and living on it with his, with, you know, with his family and and several of his friends like Neil and others, uh, and even you know explored getting a homestead and so on. It was a very, it was a very persistent fantasy for several years, and actually right after his first novel was published. You know, he had he had what remained of his advance, and he moved his mother and and his uh, sister and brother-in-law out to, out to Colorado. With the idea they would get a ranch there eventually, but his family hated it and went home very quickly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you everyone, uh, and please feel free to purchase a copy of the book, and we will have signatures at the front. Get home safe. Thank you. Thank you. Please.